We know that sound segments, phones, can be organized into categories based on their properties. Using the characters of the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, to denote them, we can thus describe the sounds of English. That is, the set of phones which comprise all of the sounds needed to pronounce any word of English. For consonants, we can describe a place of articulation. For the sound p, this is bilabial, because that sound uses the lips exclusively. We can also describe a manner of articulation. For p, a stop, because the airflow through the mouth is stopped completely and then released. A third value, voicing, is also commonly used in the description of phones. P is not voiced, that is, the vocal folds do not vibrate upon release. We can contrast this with B, which is exactly the same as P, except that the vocal folds vibrate when the air is released. Other examples of voiced voiceless pairs are S and Z, as in mace and maze, where the Z is voiced. If you place your hand on your throat while saying S versus Z, you will feel the vibration of the vocal folds only while saying Z. Go ahead and try it. Thus, for consonants, the typical format for descriptions of phones is voicing plus place of articulation plus manner of articulation. So, for pa, we can denote it as a voiceless bilabial stop. Ba, a voiced bilabial stop. Sa, a voiceless alveolar fricative. Za, a voiced alveolar fricative. But what is a fricative? We'll get to that in a second. First, let's review the possible places of articulation for English sounds. There are bilabial, the use of the lips and nothing more, labiodental, the use of the bottom lip and the top front teeth, interdental, the use of the tongue between the front teeth, alveolar, the use of the tongue on the alveolar ridge, postalveolar, the use of the tongue near the area directly behind the alveolar ridge, palatal, the use of the tongue near the palate, velar, use of the back of the tongue against the velum, and glottal, the use of the glottis. Now, on to the possible manners of articulations for English sounds. We've already mentioned a stop, also known as a plosive, which involves a full closure of the oral cavity blocking the airflow. Typically, this also suggests a release during which the sound is actually produced. We also have a nasal manner of articulation, which typically involves a full closure of the oral cavity, but with the velar port open such that the air can escape through the nasal cavity. What is the velar port? It's a little flap of skin at the velum, which allows air to escape into the nasal cavity. Thus, you can make a noise while your lips are together. This is why you can make the sound mmm and not have to open your lips. A fricative, which involves a constriction of the airflow to make the air turbulent, also known as fricated. This will typically produce a hissy kind of sound, like s or z. An affricate, which is a stop and a fricative in rapid sequence, treated as a single sound segment. The two English affricates are ch, as in church, and j, as in judge. An approximant, which involves the placing of the body of the tongue near some area in the mouth without necessarily full contact. The English er is a good example of this. A lateral approximant, which is a particular kind of approximant in which air is allowed to flow around the sides of the tongue but not directly over it. For example, the sound ol, as in lateral. And finally, a glide, which involves changing the shape of the oral cavity from one configuration to another to produce a frequency differential. These are sounds like y or wa, as in yacht or we. One additional feature a phone may have is known as aspiration. Put simply, a phone which is aspirated will have a much larger puff of air during the release compared with an unaspirated counterpart. Notice I mentioned a release, so here we know we're talking about stops. Aspiration is marked by a diacritic, a small additional symbol which attaches to an IPA character, in this case, the small h. In English, the phones p, t, and k are always aspirated if they're at the beginning of a word and before a vowel. Thus, feel the difference in the release of the p sound in a word like spat versus pat. You should feel a puff of air after the P in pat, but not so much after the P in spat. Placing a sheet of paper in front of your mouth while you pronounce these words can make the effect visible. We'll talk more about aspiration when we go over phonology. Now, onto vowels. 
Unlike most consonants, vowels do not involve contact between the tongue and some surface in the mouth. To the contrary, they involve the tongue moving so as to change the shape of the resonance chamber, the oral cavity, and thus change the quality of the sound produced. Because of their differential nature versus consonants, vowels are described differently, namely, tongue height plus tongue frontness plus tense versus lax. Note that this is for English. Many languages do not have tense-lax pairs, and thus the tense-lax difference isn't needed for those languages. What is tongue height? It's how high or low the tongue sits in the mouth during the articulation of the vowel. This is contrasted with tongue frontness, how forward or backward the tongue moves during the articulation. And the tense-lax distinction is a differentiation between pairs of vowels that are otherwise extremely similar. For English, e versus i. The tongue is slightly more relaxed, that is, very slightly lower, during the articulation of a lax vowel versus its tense counterpart. Thus, e, the high front tense vowel, versus i, the high front lax vowel, and u, the high back tense vowel, versus u, the high back lax vowel. There's also a, the mid front tense vowel, e, the mid front lax vowel, o, the mid back tense vowel, a, the mid back lax vowel, a, the low front vowel, and a, the low back vowel. Notice for low front and no back, there is no tense lax pair, so we can leave that part off. Remember that this chart corresponds to tongue height and tongue backness, so essentially, we are organizing vowels by tongue position. There is also what's known as the mid central vowel, called a schwa. This is the sound produced when the mouth is open and the tongue is in a natural, relaxed position. That is, the uh sound. Now, a little bit of jargon. A technical term for a vowel is a monophthong, and this is contrasted with diphthong, which is two vowels in sequence instead of a single vowel. The English singular subject pronoun I is produced in a stress position as a diphthong, that is, I or I. As usual, don't trust English spelling here. Words that are spelled with two vowel letters in English orthography often do not actually contain a diphthong. For example, sore, feed, or friend. Now that we have a way to talk about phones and features of phones, we can begin to organize them by a natural class. A natural class is a set of phones which share some property, or the intersection of sets of phones which share some properties. That is, a particular phone P is a member of a natural class N if and only if P shares all the properties of N. So, the natural class of bilabial stops might consist of P and B, given that these are the only two bilabial stops in the overall set of phones. That is, the intersection of all the phones which are bilabial, and all the phones which are stops, is the natural class of bilabial stops. Thus, we could say that P, T, and K are members of the natural class of voiceless stops. V, Z, and Z are members of the natural class of voiced fricatives. R and O are members of the natural class of approximants. B is not a member of the voiceless class, but B is a member of the bilabial class. Other, more broad categories may be used in natural classes. For example, sibilant, which is any hissy S-type sound, or even consonant and vowel. But natural classes must be exhaustively defined. So, T and V might be members of consonants, but there are many other consonants besides T and V. Thus, T and V together are not a natural class even if they may be consonants, because they're not all of the consonants. Similarly, B and D are not the natural class of voiced stops, because G is also a voiced stop. B, D, and G are the natural class of voiced stops in English, because there are no other voiced stops to choose from. And that is how phones are defined and referred to in linguistics. But how do phones go together? We know that languages don't just throw them in any old order. The study of how phones actually go together in a language is phonology, and that's the topic of the next episode.